So um, thought, uh, yeah. In, um, so uh, while at IBM, I'm spending actually a lot of my time um, working on the um, uh, power systems and, and improving the performance of those. And that's sort of, I guess, what um, Tim sort of said in the introduction that um, uh, sort of started doing SQL and then sort of ended up uh, doing far too much uh, coding. So I ha had to find a, an employer that would actually uh, support that. So where I come from at the moment is uh, in sunny Canberra, and I say sunny loosely speaking because, you know, it's probably just uh, about to rain. So uh, if I run inside, you'll know why. <laughs> um, had to pull off the deck soon. Uh, as Peter sort of covered in the keynote that um, we're at tw the 25 year mark for MySQL um, and presenting uh, Daniel Van Eden's graph here on, you know, how it progressed over the years. So from a dark corners of MySQL uh, perspective, we can see that a lot of the code was sort of written um, around 2001. Um, as the foundation basis and obviously there's been significantly forks and replacements a bit but some of the code from like 2001 is still around. So if we look at like what computing was like in 2001 there was this supercomputer the IBM ASCII white at Lawrence Livermore uh, National Labs um, it weighed a lot um, it had you know 8k processors and six terabytes of RAM um, incidentally, you know, back uh, last year, the Lawrence Livermore again has got an IBM uh, computer on Power9 systems uh, called uh, Sierra that's sort of the, the vastest in the world helping out with Corona. On the, you know, not one of um, things, there's the IBM E series uh, was launched in that year. Um, it also weighed a lot. Uh, 2,500 pounds. It was an entire rack um, and it had 8 to 5, 12 gig and up to uh, four processor modules. However, in, just to be not totally IBM specific, in that year, uh, HP and Intel um, released the Itanium, uh, which had like four CPUs um, in like a, a more user-based market. They didn't sell many of them. However, it advanced the computing to that whole 64 bits. If what was more likely a uh, machine actually used by uh, laptops is in the range of like a G4, it had like half a gig of processor, singular. Um, it had one megabyte cache and 256 uh, meg of RAM. 2001 was also the year that the Linux 2.4.0 kernel was released. Um, was also the same year that Windows XP came out. Um, so you see some of those artifacts in the uh, code base too. And if we do an ultra short version of um, how the performance has improved over the years, uh, in 2010 we got NADB, we got the ability to do um, multiple updates on a, a table at the same time uh, and not just inserts. Uh, Pacona put um, a lot of work into improving the NADB to get extra DB as a um, enhanced product. Um, MariaDB uh, in 2013 realized the the replication on a single stream can't actually keep up so got parallel replication. replication. And joyfully in uh, MySQL 8 the uh, query cache got removed um, which I, I see as, you know, the great removal of a feature uh, as, a, um, as a performance game. So where I actually started um, on code bases and using a technique known as, as, as a look for the code um, that MariaDB, MySQL and Pacona all pull, put out their source code all on GitHub and all provide documentation on how to uh, build it. So the, there's really nothing stopping you from actually going deep into it. One of the uh, functions I came across while just doing a, um, a, a peruse through trying to solve something different was this bit. And it kind of struck to me as like, wow, that's just an odd way of doing it. Um, if you look like closely at the function, you can see that 
you just if the two inputs are the same you're returning the same number so uh, would have been just simpler to write that if we use Matt Gobold's uh, compiler explorer we see what the code actually translates to um, byte for byte um, well instruction for instruction on Intel uh, and see that you know we go through a, a series of branches and while it'd be really quick if both of the inputs uh, string results um, or both the int, int results, you know, it, it, it's a bit long. So if we do the simplification, um, replace the first lines 9 and 10 with n if a equals b return a um, and look at the code side by side, we can see we've actually just reduced the size of the code. Now, this in, in itself, if you can reduce the size of the code for the same benefit, you allow the CPU cache to cache more of the instruction code in its uh, caches. And for a hot function like this, it's important to keep in um, because, yeah, it gets executed multiple times per query. Uh, we also see from the output on the green on the top right hand side that the instruction path is similar. We take the first two arguments, we compare them, and we jump to the .l1 label at the bottom, which is return. So what a really simple path does for CPU processes, the processes have a concept called branch prediction. Um, it's very complicated, but you know, the, the more predictable a branch means the more things like um, pre-fetching and pre-processing within the processor, it's, uh, processor itself can, can occur. And, you know, while it's got, you know, a bad rap and sort of spectre meltdown, it's like exposing things, for the most part, you know, the pipelining and um, pre-calculating results is, is actually a gain. Another corner of the code I came across was this my register file name. Um, this is called uh, whenever MySQL opens a file. Uh, it's mainly there to keep track of the uh, file name of, associated with a file descriptor. Um, and so it can print errors easily. Um, probably it's a bit of uh, extra overhead for what's uh, typically needed, but um, it, it works. Uh, however, what noticed um, around that there is this mutex lock around uh, the thread open uh, when you're actually putting the data in this structure. Now, within a, uh, a Unix pro uh, process, the, the file descriptor FD is actually unique for the process. So there's actually no need to put locking around this structure because you're not going to register the file name from two bits of the code base at the same time. Um, so the simple fix is actually just in the red to remove the, the, the mutex lock. Um, at the same time, I replace those, uh, the increments with a statistics increment. Um, that actually in the production build of uh, MySQL doesn't um, actually use that thread lock. Uh, it uses a statistic lock and um, and it's not actually um, using that lock. So it's it's optimized out in that way. Uh, so this is in MariaDB 10.3.7. Uh, MySQL still got a bug out for it. Um, though I checked the other day and the code base underneath has uh, significantly changed. How they still do it use a, a thread lock there. Which brings to, you know, another mechanism, um, sorry, another uh, fault I came across um, by just looking at the code. There's this thing called large pages as, as a setting. Um, there's a whole big um, uh, MySQL manual page on it there. Um, as Alexei uh, opened up and confessed to, he wrote it back at like 2004. Um, the 2.4 was the latest kernel. Uh, that shared memory was the only way to actually do it at the time. Uh, if you look at the, the manual, the things to get large pages to work, 
got to do a bunch of sys controls. You've got to change a bunch of uh, memory groups. You've got to set up some mount options. You've got to change some memory lock limits. Um, and it's not surprising, no one uses it. It's just too hard. Um, and what's, I guess, also a consequence of it, you know, being too hard is um, it, you know, disappears out of the code base. Um, it gets broken um, by other features and no one really cares. I, I mean, the, the MySQL bugs here are actually still open. So because, um, you know, that was a really old feature that um, what happened in like the 2632 kernel was in addition to the processes at the time starting to push out, well, there's actually more than one large page size. Um, it's not just two meg, you can have one gig as well. Uh, they also made it available as a huge TLBFS. And what huge TLBFS does is it actually is a lot simpler than shared memory pages. Um, it doesn't have the extensive permission controls. Um, it's accessed by uh, fairly standard MMAP calls. Um, and in the 3.8 kernel there, um, what we see is that there's um, a number of different TLB sizes that you can actually use. Um, so uh, by using all this knowledge, you could actually um, rip out a huge amount of complexity uh, and sort um, a multiple large page sizes at the same time. And yeah, this is what's uh, just got merged last week in 10.5.3. And, uh, and there's a MySQL bug still open on that with a similar implementation. It's important to note here that it's not just Linux that's doing innovation. Um, in this time, um, Windows actually added a bunch of calls around large pages as well. And so I was actually able to write an implementation there and um, get my skill compiled on uh, Windows for, for the, the first time and, and get that going. Um, another option where Linux has sort of come uh, and started to provide the interfaces that were um, once previously restricted to um, more complicated implementation is temp files. So here was the implementation of how MySQL created temporary files. We did make s temp to get a unique file on the file system, which is the right way to do it. Uh, and then immediately after we deleted it. Now in, um, since like Spectre and Meltdown, um, every syscall is uh, getting extra overhead on flushing caches, uh, flushing pipelines um, and various else. So the more we can actually remove the number of syscalls, um, especially like two in immediate sequence, uh, the better our um, performance is gonna be. If we look at the open manual page on how things do syscalls, there was a temp file flag added in the Linux kernel in 3.11. So we should be able to use this instead of, uh, you know, an, an open and a, and a delete. And also note here that just because it's created as a temp file, um, uh, doesn't mean we can't actually link it to a location on the file system. Um, and as far as I know, that hasn't been done. Um, that sort of saves, you know, if you're doing a big alter table and it suddenly crashes, that you don't actually need to clean out files out of the, the file system. Um, I don't, so there's that opportunity still to go. So to correct, you know, the temp files, we can just add a, a bit of code that um, makes sure that it does temporaries uh, and uses the o temp file flag onto open um, and sort of falls back to the previous me mechanisms otherwise. And so for those of you who've seen the um, o temp file not supported on blah, 
um, in your logs. Um, that's my fault. Um, what happens uh, is that TempFS, for some reason, doesn't support temporary files, which um, <laughs> seems like a bit of a, uh, an oxymoron, but it, it, it just doesn't. Uh, it might later. But we preserve a state here to, to make sure you're not flooded those every time a, a file um, doesn't work. Now that we've looked at, you know, a bunch of just looking at the code and sort of um, thinking about what can be changed, whether it's, you know, ugly um, or whether there's new kernel features, features available, um, sometimes you need to like show there's an impact. And for that, there's like Sysbench. Um, so Sysbench um, is maintained by Alexei, um, wrote, wrote the, the large pages and been around for a long time. And it, if I could spell empty right, um, that this is a simple test on how you'd modify a, a test to just create files. And so this is a mainly a test, uh, not so much of the temp files, but of the uh, locking one previously, uh, where we had a, a global lock. So the in the source code for Sysbench, that empty test.lua contains uh, you need to you know do a populate of what to do when the thread begins, an event, what happens every time and what to do when it's done. So in this case, make a connection, um, uh, run a query, um, create a different file, not only for the thread ID, but um, for every time through the loop. So in this, when we run it uh, like this, by just pointing it at the host, uh, specifying run 600 threads, because that's a good number, uh, for 60 seconds, we see that um, it was able to create um, half a million uh, events in that 60 seconds, which isn't too bad for creating files. But if we've got the code base, what we can do is, you know, compare um, a modified version if with the locks taken out and that one. So now that we know how to look at the code base um, to write a test case, um, what we need to do is point to where in uh, the problem the code actually is. Uh, and we use like perf for that a as a mechanism um, and Valerie will talk about EBF in a different talk uh, if he hasn't already. Um, so perf uh, is a standard Linux tool. Um, it's as a package to get meaningful information on um, the reports you generate it, you need the debug info from MariaDB or MySQL or Pocona that corresponds to the compiled version. Uh, if you're using a distro version, it's normally in a separate repository. Uh, if you're um, using straight from the upstream uh, bundled packages, uh, they've normally got it as a separate package in the same repository. So it's pretty easy just to install those. And that doesn't actually interfere with the current executables. It just provides uh, information when we do the perf uh, report later. So before we do a, a report, we have actually got to record um, what uh, the MySQL uh, process is doing. So we just use perf record. Uh, we use dash G to record the stack uh, traces. And so why this is important, because um, seeing a lot of time in a mutex code isn't that important if you don't know which mutex it is. Uh, we specify an out, pro out file, uh, we specify the process, um, and we use an arbitrary process like sleep here to record the amount of time. Um, three seconds may not seem a lot, but it's recording at uh, 4,000 samples a second. Um, if you want to record something longer, um, you can reduce the frequency down and put the 
uh, increase the length of time. Uh, another alternative just using sleep is to do your MySQL statement that you want to uh, test. So for example, if you want to see what MySQL does uh, with a particular select statement, um, by all means, put that at the end of the perf recording. When doing recording, um, it's, your aim is to actually keep the number of samples um, reasonable. So uh, finding out something that occurs every one in a million times isn't that useful. We want a kind of sampling um, uh, enough. So probably engineer it around to get a thousand samples. Uh, if you go too much, it will actually need to stall a little bit to to get through it, um, uh, to get th enough recording. So start small, um, see what that generates. And if you need to go um, bigger or longer, um, you can. If we look at what perf report actually generates, um, use dash G again for the stack. Uh, we specify an input file and uh, this is generally what we get. So by default, it includes the children of a pers of a function um, when it does the recording. So this is what we get. You know, MySQL is a multi-threaded program. It uh, starts with a clone, a spawn thread. Uh, the workload I've got is um, a lot around a uh, lot of connections. So we've got a lot of handling connections, pricing command, um, and as we go down, we see a prepared statement. Uh, so overall, this, I guess, is a basic sanity check to see if it's, uh, you know, within the, the processing of the commands. Um, other threads include, like, InnoDB purge threads uh, that might occur. So if you see those high on the performance profile, um, it might indicate um, more likely a, a, a lack of tuning uh, rather than a database problem, but you never know. Uh, if we add the dash dash no children option to perf report, uh, what we see is the base level functions where the CPU spends most of its time. Uh, so obviously running this on a power system, um, and believe it or not, MySQL and MariaDB spend a lot of time uh, copying around memory. And whether that's into buffers or not, we uh, need to find out. If we hit plus on any one of those functions, we can uh, see uh, the um, stack all the way down as to how it generates. Got to that. So now it's back into the top down view. We go from the handle connection on the left uh, all the way down to the memory copy uh, down the bottom. Uh, we see along the way that the percentage uh, CPU is kind of dropping down uh, and that indicates possibly a, a small bit of uh, memory copy use in that function. Um, but what we can see from this is there's uh, no major block where it's actually doing memory copy. It's just a lot of small memory copies um, at various places around the uh, stack. If we hit like annotate on Perth, what we get here is a mixture of the C code and the assembly code it generates. The uh, percentage on the left is within that function. So in this uh, function, we've got like a 26% um, doing something related to the while loop condition. Uh, it takes a bit of thinking and knowing what the assembly does to, to work out which bit of that while instruction uh, is actually causing the problem. But sometimes this is enough to actually put in a bug report and saying, this is taking a lot of time, maybe it shouldn't and let someone else deal with it. With perf recordings and uh, Brenda Gregg's flame graphs, by running the same perf recording, 
uh, through two scripts, you all of a sudden get a SVG flame graph. So this shows a, a similar sort of thing in a different form that of the MySQL process, a lot of time is actually spent in the handle connection and the width of the bar indicates uh, how much time of the entire thing is within that function and also shows the call stack uh, from bottom to top. And I'm sure there's a stack order bug uh, pun there I could throw in, but no, I'm not quick enough. Uh, we can also see from uh, this flame graph, there's actually on the top sections of the flame graph, there's a lot of time spent in handling UTF-8 and UCA and other kind of character set related things. And this might be if you're looking at how to actually improve the performance is like something you might want to actually tackle. Because if you tackle those, um, you might get an extra 10% um, uh, of CPU back in, in a uh, ideal case. The other thing you'll see about the code base, remember it was written in like 2000, uh, well bits were quite old, is it doesn't quite account to NUMA. Um, and what NUMA is, is rather than all processors having equal access to memory is the computer is actually divided into a number of nodes. Um, processors uh, can access their, their local memory quick enough. Um, however, to access the memory of the other side is has to go through a uh, an interconnect uh, for that. Uh, and this is something that's easily forgotten when you're looking like a cloud service and you go, oh, okay, I just need a big service, so many CPUs. Um, yeah, sometimes those CPUs aren't actually on the same node as the other CPUs. Um, so getting MySQL to be um, intelligent about these uh, interconnects is going to be a challenge. Um, I've seen numerous MySQL engineers and MariaDB engineers sort of screaming that, you know, at the aspect, and I'm sure users have too, that I added more processes to this thing and it goes slower. And so part of that is because, you know, the, the caches on one node aren't actually shared with the other node. And when the other node accesses them, um, the first node can't cache them anymore. So because of that internodal effects, um, you can actually get this case where more processes drops performance. Uh, as this, um, so for instance, this is a um, old uh, IBM uh, Power 8. I mean old like three years. Uh, it's not, not huge old. Uh, but yeah, it has um, 80 processes on um, 80 CPUs on each node. There's two nodes. Each is uh, 128 gig. Um, and those are like eight threads per core. There's 20 cores on them. Um, and there's a cache hierarchy, which I haven't shown there. But in this NUMA control information, you see that the distance between different nodes um, is uh, greater by a, f uh, a factor. And while this is just an operating system uh, hint um, it and isn't exceptionally accurate, it, it does translate that, you know, there is an eff effect of the nodes. How when you can run a, a workload on it that sort of fills up like a HTOP graph full of um, so many process, you know, it's, it's a good thing. However, what we need to actually make sure is that each thread is actually doing useful work and not just thrashing around a lock from one place to another. And as you throw, you know, more hardware at systems, you know, whether that, you know, be an entire uh, system here or on the cloud, um, it starts to show up some of the bottlenecks that 
weren't perhaps totally accounted for in the in the code base. So when I came across late last year uh, in a perf recording, um, if we uh, narrowed down to it, there's this place where buffer pool stats end page gets plus plus happens. This is the variable within MySQL that corresponds to inner D buffer pool read requests. Uh, for those who have looked at uh, uh, show global status, you'll notice that that is a big number. Uh, incredibly big. You wouldn't believe how incredibly big it is. However, um, what we see there uh, from the statement that it is basically in each buffer pool, there is a statistic structure and that gets incremented. Uh, we see in the instructions there, it is the LD or the load instruction that is slow to retrieve a value from memory. Um, in terms of retrieving a value from memory, a load isn't usually slow. However, um, because this is a value that is written to so often, um, that means uh, if it was in one CPU and one cache uh, and it was written to a lot, uh, that would be actually fine. Uh, however, when multiple CPU caches and more so multiple CPU caches across nodes uh, start realizing, oh, okay, I need to grab that memory location. That means I need to invalidate the CPU cache in a different node. And then once that's invalidated, need to actually fetch the value from memory. Now, while there might be some um, ways in the process to actually speed this up, uh, it's fundamentally a bottleneck from a simple counter um, and uh, one that actually has been fixed in the latest MySQL 8.0.20 release. Hello, dog. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, so, um, so we see the load is slow and that's why the load is slow. It needs it to invalidate the cache. Uh, the store on the other hand is quite quick uh, because once you've done the load, you've got the reservation um, of that memory location and you can write back to it uh, uh, quicker. However, that doesn't actually prevent a mother, another process in those few intermediate instructions from um, trying to grab it back. The other thing uh, that you can see by looking at perf profiles that was a bit slow, and I indicated this in the fine graphs, some of the character set functions are slow. And if we look at like an example of uh, my STR in simple whatever that is, um, what we see that in this function, there's a lot of byte by byte access through a mapping function uh, to convert it. Um, we saw in the history, in the beginning of the talk, that um, in 2001, there was this thing called 64-bit. Um, when we're processing characters, we're still doing it byte at a time. Um, I don't have a solution for this, but um, it probably would in, involve either A, you know, seeing what someone else has done uh, clever and faster, um, or B, actually just using a bit more memory uh, and rather than doing uh, a byte at a time to, you know, a block at a time and, and use a bit more memory in the translation table now that, you know, we've got more than, you know, 256 mega RAM, usually. So in the examples I've covered, we've covered, um, you know, some code is just a little bit ugly. Um, you know, I've written some bad code. I will continue to write a little bit of bad code every now and then. Um, and that just needs to be cleaned up. There's kernel supported features that happen that allow um, blocks of code to be simplified. 
uh, as the C++ language comes across, we get things like atomics and thread local variables that enable performance to be increased. So um, what I didn't cover here um, in MySQL 5.7, um, if you get a contended mutex, uh, what it'll do is it will spin on itself uh, a few times doing nothing um, for a random amount of time. That random amount of time was determined by just a, a simple mathematical uh, add multiply uh, function that has some uh, significant random uh, characteristics. However, those are two variables that are in a global context. So remember when we saw with the statistics counter, um, that same thing is actually happening while you're spinning from mutex on MySQL 5.7. Um, it's, yeah, uh, creating a, a lot of work on the CPU cache and the bus to um, wait, which which is quite ironic. Um, so yes, uh, the other aspect uh, we covered was like hardware that you know we've got uh, huge amounts of threads that are starting to come available. If we look at what Postgres has done, we've seen them uh, start to implement using multiple threads to do things like sort and join and, and fetch data from multiple sources. The MySQL code base and the MariaDB code base are still largely single threaded. To process query does one thing at a time through the threads, which means, you know, threads can be used for, you know, multiple concurrent queries, um, but it would be good to actually start to utilize those to help out with the same query and fetching locations from multiple things. And NUMA will, you know, continue to uh, form a, a challenge for the coders of the MySQL code base because um, it's all pooled. We've got this big thing called the buffer pool and everything is stored in there and there's no fragmentation. And while we can go on a higher level, level and and start to do, you know, multiple instances and have like an instance per this kind of table. Um, there's there's also an aspect that might be able to improve uh, by taking into account that, you know, um, memory and CPU aren't always co-located. And to finish off by saying, you know, there are dark corners. Um, dark corners is uh, easily fixed by shining the light on them to write a test case, to point at this bit of code and going, that's ugly, to um, throw some test cases and say, here, th this shows that this bit of code could be better. And so dark corners can be fixed, but it, all it takes is a little bit of sunlight. So thank you. Okay, are you there? I am. There's a little bit of a technical problem there, Campbell, uh, Rodwin. Um, so just waiting for some uh, questions to come in here. Uh, I see you on drastically early too, so. <laughs> okay. Um, do I need to compile the MySQL server from scratch to do a performance trace, to record a performance trace? Uh, no, you don't. Um, you just need to actually uh, download the debug symbols um, from the, the repo and that should have it all there. And yeah, those don't actually impact with uh, the system as it is. Um, another question is, is any database data stored in the perf traces? Uh, in theory, no, the, the uh, perf man page um, or online documentation is a, a, a couple of uh, quick warnings. However, for the most part, it's actually just taking the instruction tr trace and what's on the stack. Uh, while in theory, you know, there might be the ability to infer something about the uh, 
uh, data from those. Um, normally, it's not very much. Uh, I mean, the things like a, a table name, um, you know, there's you probably couldn't infer, infer anything beyond, you know, maybe the length of the string used in a table name. So if you have perf recordings and um, you want to share them, and I encourage you to do so to actually try to get some of these bottlenecks fixed, um, that, uh, yeah, it's really safe to do so. Um, it's even safer once you look at like the perf report output because there you can actually see that there's no data, that it's just, a bunch of statistics and a bunch about the MySQL code base and where it was running at the time. There's no use of data there. Very good. And finally, one person asked, if I wanted to start with small patches to the server, what should I look at? Uh, okay. Um, there's some existing shallow uh, MySQL bugs and MariaDB bugs that uh, around like a simple, you know, date time function, not returning the right result. Um, those are, you know, remarkably self-contained um, as far as going through and they normally only take, you know, one or two lines of code to actually fix. You just got to find out which ones and um, write the test case for them. Okay. Uh, someone is typing in a question right now, and I'm just waiting for it to come in. Let's just see here. Uh, the joys of modern technology. Um, after the, that, um, you know, since I've got a bit of time, I might actually share one of my own, you know, war stories. Uh, <laughs> for, <Go ahead>. for, <laughs> unless, you know, there's booing on the channel, but anyway. We'll see. So, uh, somebody says, Daniel mentioned at the beginning a C compiler he was using, but I missed it. What do you mean, mind telling us again? Uh, sorry, advantages of a C compiler? No, uh, Daniel mentioned at the beginning a C compiler he was using. So you, okay. know, you mentioned that you're using a specific C compiler. Oh, oh sorry, that online one. Um, it's Compiler Explorer um, right. with, um, by uh, Matthew Godbolt. And uh, what you can do is you can just throw a little bit of code up there and, and watch it generate the output. Okay. And what you can also do with that one is play around with the optimization options, um, see how the code is different. And you can also switch between MySQL versions and, and watch how uh, uh, compilers have actually changed in the way they generate their output. And there's also, you know, different architectures you can, um, throw out a power output and uh, throw out uh, an ARM output and a MIPS and for the same bit of code and, and compare and contrast. So yeah, fun tool that way. And let's see, one person is typing here. Let's just wait for Chris to uh, finish up. In the meantime, if you do have any more stories, I'm sure we would be happy to hear them. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. Oh, one of, this one person asks, are there some tag beginner friendly? I'm assuming he's referring to patches. Yep. Yep. In um, MariaDB code base, there's a beginner friend friendly. I think there's a trivial one in the um, MySQL bugs. Um, it doesn't seem to be consistently applied. So, um, yeah. Look at the problem. If it's, it seems easy, um, uh, give it a go. Um, also, I guess other places uh, to ask for help. Um, MariaDB's got a Zulip channel. Uh, the MySQL community's got a, a Slack channel. Um, if you want to actually uh, take on one of these tasks or, or want you know, some guidance on where in the code base to actually start looking on a problem, um, yeah, that's a, a great place to start and a great place to ask questions um, if you're stuck. One person mentioned the MariaDB Foundation probably has small tasks for developers wanting to get into the MySQL MariaDB code base. So. Yep, yeah, and those are a lot of the beginner-friendly ones. Um, I, the ones that are, you know, 
never quite get enough developer attention to to fix but you know aren't actually too hard <laughs> but hey it's always good to have them available um, it's fun at that okay so war story of mine um i was working for a a shared ho hosting company um at um at the same time i was doing dba work and had you know this was my other job as like a system admin there and had this like downtime. We needed to upgrade a few things um, and, and shut a few servers down. And I thought, okay, we, they've got enough time. We've got a four hour window. Um, let's see what it'll take to do a, a distro upgrade. I'm not going to actually do it, you know, this system, but we'll see it anyway. Uh, looked in the, in the documentation and this was like a Debian system. It had uh, a 2632 kernel. Um, I thought, oh yeah, good. There's like this LVM support. It's got these LVM snapshots. And yeah, there's this function of, you know, restore to checkpoint um, of that. So I'll just take a checkpoint, do the upgrade, take a note of what breaks, um, you know, analyze that a bit later, um, then just roll back to the snapshot. Uh, so yeah, in the window, yep. Yeah, uh, take the server down was um, was just a VM running on um, on that. So ran a snapshot on the underlying system. Tried it, recorded what I want, and got to the point of returning to the checkpoint and went. That kernel um, support isn't there. The kernel support was in the LVM tools. It wasn't actually in the kernel. Uh, so, you know, it was like, oh, shit, what now? Um, so I started panicking um, and um, I ended up grabbing the source code for the kernel, taking a patch um, for uh, what was applied a couple of releases later that says um, actually implement the restore to snap off point and yes in a comp uh, outage window i was compiling kernel merging a patch in that didn't cleanly go um and then you know crossing fingers and booting up the kernel there so i could actually restore back to the checkpoint where the, where i thought it was going to go actually smoothly so oops um yeah <laughs> i mean share hosting aren't the the kind of places to uh have multiple copies of things, but um, yes, importance of uh, trying it out and perhaps not on a production net system next time. <laughs> Fun. Very good. But these are the mistakes we learn from. And hey, and you know, the outdoor window might have got slightly longer than actually scheduled, but the customers kept their data. <laughs> Phew, and I kept my job. 